could everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, and um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I get the impression that I'm probably the only one on the call from outside the state. Uh, so greetings from West Virginia. Um, like was mentioned, um, today I'll be talking about biological control of invasive plants, namely Tree of Heaven, using fungi. Uh, but my program um, uses biocontrol, um, fungi to control invasive pathogens like chestnut blight, um, invasive pests. I'm currently working on a project using fungi to kill elongate hemlock scale. So if that's something that you're seeing up there and you want to talk uh, at a later point, uh, I have my contact email at the end of this talk. So, um, but let's get into this. Um, so I've been working on biological control of Tree of Heaven since my PhD time. Um, so about 13 years I've, I've been at it, um, working uh, to combat this invasive plant. Um, if you're on the call and you're not muted, could you go ahead and mute? Because I'm hearing a lot of, uh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and do presentation mode. Now, it will be challenging for me to see the text as we go. So um, if you need to interject to ask a question, feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll be glad to answer your questions as we um, proceed to the end. Uh, so let me put it in presentation mode here. We'll actually be taking leading questions from the chat box at the end. So if anybody okay. has a question, please just insert it in the chat box if that's okay. Great. So this is a, a recent, I, I took this, um, I downloaded this yesterday, the county level distribution map for Tree of Heaven. And, you know, when you look around at this, um, you might be thinking, okay, well, it's obviously pretty widespread. Um, and, you know, to see a map like this and to see a, a, an invasive species with such a wide distribution um, maybe leads one to think, well, is it hopeless at this point? Um, what can we do, you know, when, when something's been here for 237 years, really, how do we, how do we start even thinking about, you know, controlling and combating such an entrenched invasive species? And by entrenched, I mean that it's not just in the urban areas, and, um, it's in our forests, deep in our forests, um, and along our railways and highways and every travel corridor that came about since the 1780s. Um, in fact, Tree of Heaven, uh, there's not many species that were introduced before Tree of Heaven with regard to invasive trees. Norway maple is the only example that was introduced earlier by Bartram in 1756. Uh, but you can look at this map and, and, and you know, this map is not perfect, but it's, it's it, this Invasive Plant Atlas is a great tool. It's a great site uh, where you can kind of look at, um, you know, where Atlantis has been documented. Some counties, it's been, um, Luckily, or fortunately, it's been eradicated in those locations. Um, and in other counties, it just hasn't been reported yet. So if you see a county that's white and you know it's there, well, then report it. But why do we care about a tree that arrived in 1784? Well, it costs a lot of money to manage invasive species, um, particularly once they're deeply embedded into the kind of fabric of our landscape. And that's what Tree of Heaven has done. Um, like I said, it's been here since 1784, and I'm going to walk you through how it got from, you know, a botanical oddity um, to an entrenched invasive plant in our forests. But one of the reasons we really care about a tree that was introduced 237 years ago is the idea of invasion meltdown. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but this is where one invasive species in a new environment makes it easier for other non-native species to invade. And this is particularly true for in, uh, invasive pests coming in and recognizing an invasive plant host, um, which they co-evolved with in the native range. Um, so Tree of Heaven's been here for 240 years, but only in the last few years have we seen invasives like spotted lanternfly and um, brown marmorated stink bug and um, shot hole borer of Atlantis show up. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them. I want to kind of point your attention to two things. Um, I'm sure spotted lantern flies on everybody's mind, um, certainly with the Finger Lakes region um, being so important for wine production um, and, and also orchards for apple production in the state. Um, you look at these trees and you see this, this plant hopper and it's just, you know, when it rains, it pours spotted lantern fly. And like gypsy moth, they can lay their eggs on trailer hitches and RVs and firewood and, and be moved around quite easily. The, the map here that I want to kind of point out in the lower left hand, lower right hand corner 
um, is um, an FIA data um, plot. Um, you can see Pennsylvania here in the map. You can see a little bit of, of the southern tier of New York as well. And you can see counties where there's Atlantis and FIA data. So everywhere you see a yellow dot. Well, those purple um, areas denote areas that have been spotted lanternfly positive. And it speaks to how an entrenched invasive plant is providing refuge for a secondary invasive pest. Um, and here we can see a distribution of Atlantis and we can see its density is very high in the mid-Atlantic um, and, and really provides a, not only a beacon on the landscape uh, to attract these secondary pests, but a bridge across the landscape to allow for widespread distribution. So again, um, spotted lanternfly is one of the newer ones that showed up in 2014. But we know, for example, the brown marmoted stink bug, which showed up in the late 90s in Pennsylvania. Um, there's, there's a common theme here. Pennsylvania is a good spot for invasives. And I know New Yorkers probably, um, you know, kind of punch uh, Pennsylvanians in the arm every time about this and say, you know, why do you let so many pests in? Um, you know, so brown marmoted stink bug doesn't need tree of heaven. Just like, I don't know that it's been established that tree of heaven is essential for spotted lanternfly to complete its life cycle, but these are preferred hosts. And they're probably preferred because they're so wide, widely distributed. Um, and, and again, there's some of that co-evolution happening where they co-evolved with these species in their native range. So they recognize them, they can detect them. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, brown marmoted stink bugs moving around. Um, this East Asian metallic wood boring beetle was picked up in, as bycatch uh, in, in uh, EAB traps back in New Jersey in, in 2011 and 2014, 15. It turns out this is an Atlantis specific buprestid that looks a lot like emerald ash borer, um, but it's specific to Atlantis. And, you know, if Atlantis wasn't here, we wouldn't see this East Asian metallic wood boring beetle because it seems to be specific to that host. So again, um, by leaving one untouched and unmanaged or minimally managed, we're only inviting secondary pests. So of course, you know, I've read the news, uh, and, you know, and I, my, uh, my brother worked at Cornell for a number of years and I, I lived up there over the summers and, you know, spent some time in the gorges and, and, and touring the wineries along the Finger Lakes. And of course, spotted lanternfly is a scary one. And, you know, it was, it was detected, um, in, in a part of Ithaca, and I'm not sure whether it was an individual or if there was eggs or, you know, nymphs, I'm not sure. I'm sure you all could speak to that, uh, but it's, it's a huge threat and it's something that we have to take seriously because it does um, do well in, in, in fruit orchards as well as vineyards. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about Tree of Heaven in Pennsylvania and, and basically the history of its introduction. Now, if you've never seen Atlantis, um, consider yourself lucky, uh, but it looks like a walnut or a, um, maybe a larger than life staghorn sumac. I'd say walnut was more characteristic of it, but its bark is slightly different. In the midsummer, you can see these big clusters of seed that turn kind of an orange to yellow to red. Um, and it really stands out along the highway corridors. You can see it was introduced in 1784 into Philadelphia. And this is actually the house where it was introduced. This is uh, the Woodland Cemetery, which is in West Philadelphia, just north of Bartram's Garden, which is another uh, uh, botanical treasure there in Philadelphia. Um, now, Hamilton was a rich second generation Philadelphian um, who had tons of money um, and had the ability to import plants. He had the first hothouse in the United States where he used furnaces so he could um, have tropical plants. Um, and he introduced Lombardi poplar, uh, Persian silk tree, um, ginkgo. There's a number of, of, of plants that Hamilton is responsible for. And this is in the 1780s. And his house still stands there because back in the 1840s, they converted it to a rural cemetery. But as you can see in 1784, it was just kind of there in, in, in Philadelphia and, and really reserved for his uh, botanical contemporaries. He, he kind of hoarded his plants. He was very protective of them because he spent a great deal of time and money to import them and, you know, only share them with Bartram and other, you know, botanists of the day. But you could see that over time um, that it spread and it didn't spread out radially from one point and just kind of go north and west. But um, we see that it traveled along um, transportation corridors. We know that uh, after 1855, for example, in this third picture, the completion of the Trans-Pennsylvania Railroad uh, between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh 
opened up new um, avenues for Atlantis to spread. Um, and then you can see by 2011, when I, I completed this study, um, it was pretty much in a lot of the counties, even some of the northern tier along the, new, the southern tier border with New York. And we know that a lot of the, the fracking and Marshall shale drilling that happened um, in the northern tier after 2008 led to large scale road building, um, which probably moved invasive species too. Um, now, Atlantis surprisingly grows pretty big um, and, and lives pretty long. Um, you know, we, we think of it as a weed species along the highway, but I went back to Philadelphia where it was first introduced and asked the question, can we find individuals that exist from the time of Hamilton, that is dating back to the 1780s? And as it turns out, the answer was no. Uh, but we did find some pretty giant trees, including um, um, trees in Doylestown and, and um, Lemon Hill Mansion in Philadelphia. Um, this lower left-hand picture is the largest Atlantis in the United States. That's 23 feet in circumference or 88 in inches in diameter. Uh, that's in Northern Virginia. Uh, but you can see these, this tree gets really big. Um, an interesting photo here on the right shows a historic picture from 1918 um, juxtaposed um, next to a contemporary photo from 2011. And this is the oldest documented Atlantis uh, that we we're able to confirm with tree ring data. They record them all the way to the pith and figure out how old they are. So we figure they live uh, about 150 years, but for the most part, they're much younger than that throughout the state and throughout the, the invaded range of this tree. Um, so we, we kind of looked across these various historic gardens. Uh, this is just kind of a, a map of, of where we our studies were based. Um, and I'll kind of show you some more data, but just to say that, you know, there's a lot of historic gardens um, that are no longer maintained or partially maintained in and around Philadelphia that we're able to kind of uh, leverage this, including some uh, um, independence hall trees that we were able to core thanks to the National Park Service. So, you know, one of the things that was really interesting is that this was like really a phenomenon um, when you look at Bartram's um, garden catalog from the late, uh, the early 1800s, 1828, he was selling Atlantis for a premium, like a dollar a seedling. Um, and that was like more expensive than anything else in his catalog. So everybody wanted it. And uh, you can look back at historic photos and see these large diameter trees. And thankfully for us, a lot of them reported the diameters. Um, and we were able to use contemporary um, or existing Atlantis trees um, and basically figure out a regression so that we could age trees based on their diameter. And that's not something you could do with shade tolerant trees, but open grown trees like Atlantis, there's a direct relationship between age and diameter, and we could accurately estimate the age of these various trees. So we're able to go back through all these historic accounts and figure out, okay, how, how far back do these trees go? Like when did, were they established and, and figure out basically when, when certain trees established at certain locations. So it was a lot of detective work. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, to kind of bring it back to, to current times is, you know, Atlantis puts out a, a, a boatload of seed. Um, and in fact, this is one tree you can see, and, and certainly the seed production here is, is prolific and, and really raises the question, how much could one tree produce? Because to understand the invasive potential of a plant, you kind of need to do these studies to figure out what the seed production is. So we did just that, um, and we collected about seed from 50 trees. We fully removed them, destructively sampled, and collected all their seeds uh, peak. Um, we couldn't do that with this historic tree at Penn State, uh, but we did harvest a number of clusters and then count the clusters. And we figured that this one tree, for example, um, at, at Penn State has produced more than 50 million seeds in its lifetime. Uh, probably a motivation to remove the tree, but because it's right next to Old Main on, on campus there, they, they refuse to do that. Another thing we determined is that um, they can produce seeds as early as age four, and we found uh, examples of a 104-year-old tree that was producing seed. This, this tree itself is over 100 years old on Penn State's campus, and there's an older female tree at Lemon Hill Mansion in Philadelphia, uh, but generally a seed, um, the seed production on that tree was very low. Uh, but seed production ranged from 40 to almost a million seeds per tree per year, with a mean of about 70,000 seeds across all the trees we looked at. And the germination was really variable. 
two to 78 percent. Um, but, you know, the point still remains. We published a study back in 2017 and, you know, we showed that like a tree um, can produce up to a million seeds per year um, for many decades straight. So removing those female trees from the landscape, particularly before a disturbance like a clear cut or a timber harvest is really important. Speaking of timber harvests, you know, one of the things that was clear when we started this study is that despite the long residency, I said it's been here 237 years, the invasion of our forests have been relatively recent. So what could explain that? We went in and cored a number of trees and these, um, these clear cuts um, that had been occupied by Lanthus and, and we saw this pattern emerging. In the 1980s in Pennsylvania, and you might have experienced this in New York around the same time or earlier, widespread gypsy moth defoliation in oak forests um, led to kind of large scale clear cutting or salvage cutting um, to kind of uh, to get some of that that timber out, but also to recoup some of the lost uh, value. And these large scale clear cuts, um, Atlantis was already in the area, but it was not very um, high incidence. But when you had these large scale clear cuts, all it took was one female, which again, I said could produce a million seeds per year to just blow the right way. And then you have basically these clear cuts coming in completely of Atlantis. So we were definitely seeing these um, tree of heaven coming up um, basically as monocultures in these forest settings. So back in the early 2000s, my advisor who's here on the left, uh, Don Davis and a, a state forester in Pennsylvania, Steve Wacker, started to notice that these stands that had been fully colonized by Atlantis were starting to die back from what appeared to be a vascular wilt disease, definitely wilting and dying back. Um, and, and Don's first student, Mark Shaw, um, basically determined that Verticillium non-alfalfa, this fungus that we use as a biocontrol, was the causal agent. Um, and it caused acute wilt, like you see of the, the crown here in the upper, upper left. Um, and, you know, we found another fungus called Verticillium dahlia, but it, it wasn't, uh, didn't cause as severe disease as Verticillium non-alfalfa. And that was confirmed in both um, field studies and greenhouse studies. Of course, one of the questions, you know, uh, that came up immediately was, okay, well, what's the risk this fungus poses to other species? Um, so quickly, Mark um, tested a number of co-occurring species, including striped maple, white ash. Back in the day when white ash was still around and mattered, um, unfortunately, most of the ash in Pennsylvania is gone, thanks to EAB. Um, red maple, sugar maple, yellow poplar, red oak, chestnut oak. And what he showed is that um, Atlantis was definitely a most impacted, but striped maple um, did show susceptibility when you directly inoculated these trees. That is, you took basically spore suspensions and you injected into the vascular system of these plants. Um, so that was concerning, of course. Um, but, but it kind of contradicted or, you know, what he was seeing on the landscape. And that is, although Atlantis was dying rapidly, the striped maple that was in the understory, and it's a pretty common understory species here in Pennsylvania, uh, were largely um, unaffected. Um, some of them would wilt, but that percentage was probably below 5%. So natural infections of striped maple appeared to be low, despite the fact that when you directly injected the fungus in, it killed it. So this discovery in South Central Pennsylvania, which is indicated by a red dot below the word Pennsylvania, led to subsequent surveys in Virginia, um, Western Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And my colleague, Joanne Rebeck, who uh, retired from the Forest Service, and um, Amy Snyder, who was a student at Virginia Tech at the time, um, uncovered new locations of Verticillium non-alfalfa, indicating that, hey, you know, this fungus is more widespread, and we're starting to pick it up elsewhere. This was not the result of us spreading it around, but independent surveys by independent groups. Um, so uh, when I came on to do my PhD, I was interested in the efficacy and host range of this, this fungus. I told you um, a little bit that Mark Shaw, the former PhD student had tested its efficacy and a little bit of its host range. So I came in and I inoculated 100 Atlantis trees across 12 stands from 2006 to 2009. And by 2011, we saw more than 40,000 trees had be become infected and died. So it was rapidly spreading to adjacent Lanthus in those stands. Um, and it only required us to inoculate five or 10 or 20 trees. And as little as five trees um, led to complete eradication from some of these smaller stands um, in just a matter of a year or two. 
Um, we also showed that um, the, the fungus was able to kill sprouts in the understory, but have little impact on the native woody species, as can be seen there in the lower right-hand corner. Um, we revisited these sites more recently um, in 2015 and 2019, and the fungus continues to spread in those larger stands, but it's miles from where we originally inoculated. So it's, it's doing its job. It's seeking out Alanthus and taking care of them. One of the other things I was interested in, because Alanthus is not only in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Virginia, it's, it's in the West. It's, uh, you know, throughout the Southeast. It's in the, you know, the, the Texas and, and Oklahoma and places like that. So I collected um, through email correspondence, collected seed from 32 states and grew them up in a single greenhouse experiment where I inoculated them and asked the question, would any of them not wilt? Um, and, and, and in fact, we did see a few instances, three instances where we had delayed disease progression. Um, that doesn't mean that they ultimately wouldn't die, uh, but symptom development, that is wilt, took a lot longer in those. Um, and, and there could be a number of factors that explain that, but it could be genetics. Uh, but that was interesting to find. Um, we did pull the experiment at 11 weeks, so it's unclear if we had left it, let it ride for like 13 weeks, if those trees would have ultimately succumbed. But an interesting fact, if you look at the picture in the lower right-hand corner, you could see that a tolerant Elanthus was much reduced in height growth, uh, but otherwise looked fine. So, you know, the trade-off was that it was it was, it was stunted, but it was um, not wilty, if that makes sense. So we tested uh, 82 other species for susceptibility. And this includes a lot of, uh, of strange species. And you might look at this, this list and see those indicated in red and see uh, like, okay, why did you test like, you know, West India mahogany? Why did you test Florida bitterbush? Well, it turns out that some of these species are the closest North American relatives to Tree of Heaven. Um, Tree of Paradise, for example, is in the Cimarubaceae, the same family. West Indian mahogany is in the, a closely related botanical family to, to the Cimarubaceae. So it was really important to vet these things in the greenhouse and then also just test co-occurring native species. But you'll also notice a number of non-native species, Royal Polonia, Siberian Elm. There's a lot of invasive, Korean Evodia, Amur cork tree. There's a lot of invasive um, trees in Pennsylvania and New York and elsewhere throughout the mid-Atlantic. You know, we have a long history of importing plants for pleasure and some of those escape and, and some of those cause problems. And we wanted to know if the utility of our fungus would extend beyond Tree of Heaven. Um, one of the things that was um, interesting but worth, you know, spending some time talking about is that we did notice a number of species wilted when we directly injected them with the fungus. But when we followed them over time, like for example, Sassafras and Catalpa showed 100% wilt, yet they didn't die. They rebuilt their crowns, and a year or two later, you know, after 40 months or you know, or three later, three years later, you couldn't even tell that they had one time been wilted from a vascular wilt pathogen. Um, so you know, we have to think about with with perennial plants, we have to think about like what's the ultimate like a gauge for susceptibility and and um, trade-offs. You know, if, if a tree wilts but doesn't die and it's it's important native species, well, are we willing to accept that amount of risk? Perhaps. Uh, but these are, are kind of conversations that need to be had. Um, we did, however, find three species of all the 80 plus species that we tested that appeared to acquire infections through natural means. One of those was already confirmed through Mark's previous work, Stripe Maple. Um, but we saw that sumac and devil's walking stick would also wilt and die um, in, in, if in close proximity to an infected Alanthus tree. Uh, but incidence of infection was still below 15% for all three species and, and below 5% for striped maple. Um, and we were never, never able to recover the verticillium back out of staghorn sumac. So it's unclear, you know, we still have to actually confirm that the fungus is killing it, but certainly when we injected it, we knew we put it in there and a number of those wilted. So uh, it could be that there's stuff in in the sap of members of the Anacardi AC, including sumac that, that inhibit growth of the fungus and, and kept us from, from getting it back out. Um, so some of the other, is there a question? Okay. Um, some of the other things we looked at are the roles of insects um, uh, in moving this fungus. 
Um, if you've never seen ambrosia beetles, let me introduce you to a concept called sawdust noodles. Um, if you ever walk up to a tree and it looks like there's a bunch of wood noodles hanging off it, that's, uh, that's an indication that there's rice size ambrosia beetles um, that are tunneling in it to grow fungus. And um, there is an exotic ambrosia beetle called Eulacea baldus that was introduced um, accidentally in, um, in Long Island. It was first detected in 76 in, in Newtown Square in Pennsylvania in 81. And um, it's, it's basically all throughout the mid-Atlantic and, and, and northeast now. And this is uh, co-evolved with Tree of Heaven. Um, and it does help to move propagules. It doesn't farm this fungus, but it can move it on its body. So it's capable of helping in, in long-range dissemination. Similarly, um, Amy Snyder and some of the group at Virginia Tech is investigating whether or not a Chinese weevil can be used to help um, move, um, well, not only kill Tree of Heaven, but also help to move the fungus around. And that work is still ongoing. One of the things that came out of the work that, that followed my work was uh, Eric O'Neill looked at how root grafts play a critical role in disease progression. We know with historic diseases like Dutch elm disease, where you know, elm lined streets were just taken out because trees um, adjacent to each other had formed functional root grafts. Well, those same types of root grafts exist in a lamp distance. It turns out if you put the fungus into one tree, it uh, can spread to up to 20 trees around it through these intra-specific root grafts. So it explains how the disease spread so rapidly across these stands. So that was really interesting to see. Um, and some recent work done by my uh, former PhD student, uh, Kristen Wickert and Rachel Brooks, who I was on her committee at Virginia Tech, were kind of uh, asking questions um, about the interactions between verticillium non alfalfa and that less aggressive verticillium dahlia that I mentioned early on that would sometimes be detected in stands. Um, you know, if we're going to use this as a widespread biocontrol and there's another verticillium species, would that weaker verticillium species inhibit or supplant the more aggressive one and therefore um, suppress efforts to control Tree of Heaven? Um, we also wanted to get better resolution of, of verticillium non-alfalfi. The reason for this is that prior to my work, verticillium non-alfalfi was called verticillium alboatrum. And you look at the literature and they're like 300 hosts. But it's clear that, you know, now that they've kind of broken that up into several new species, that the host range is not as wide um, as, as they once claimed. And, you know, the, the thing is that we need to do some kind of updated um, host range testing to clarify those relationships now that we've figured out the taxonomy of these fungi. One of the other questions that I had all along, and the reason I kept going back to my 2006 inoculated stands, my 2008 inoculated stands, my 2009 inoculated stands, is would we be selecting for more tolerant or resistant forms of Atlantis? You know, it's great to have a biocontrol, but you know, um, the thing about biocontrol, and, and I enjoy working with native species because, you know, you don't worry about it as much as you do with introduced uh, biocontrols, but you can't call this back once you've released it. Um, so that's why that, that host range testing and efficacy, efficacy studies are so important early on. Um, but again, I'll emphasize that this is a naturally occurring native fungus. Uh, but we wanted to know if we'd be selecting for basically a super Atlantis, and that's something uh, to be concerned about. So uh, we did a lot of comparative pathogenicity tests. That is, we take isolates from eggplant and we put them in Atlantis. We take uh, isolates from Atlantis and we put them in eggplant. We take isolates from catalpa and we put them in tomato. We take isolates from potato and we put them in Atlantis and all these different versions of all these possible combinations you could think of. And uh, as it turns out, the Atlantis isolates were really the only ones that caused disease in Atlantis further supporting that there's, there, there appears to be some host specialization in those strains that we first recovered from Atlantis in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Um, so that's, that's promising. Um, one of the things that molecular biologists and, and molecular plant pathologists will, will ask you early on is, well, have you looked at its, its genetic sequence? Have you sequenced its genome? How, it, how does it differ from other closely related verticillium? Um, we sequenced our, our genome and, and we published this finally in 2019. And we just got some farm bill funding to sequence additional isolates from these different hosts to really 
fully resolve the relationships. Now, generally, we sequence a, a you know a small section of of DNA, uh, maybe called a gene or a gene region, and we compare those gene regions and, and we build family trees based on that information. Uh, but with a full genome sequence, you can look across the whole genetic code of these organisms and say, how many differences are there? Where are those differences? Um, can they group certain ways? Um, at the same time we're doing this comparative genomics work, we also recently used kind of something called um, proteomics, where you can look at the basically protein fingerprints of these different strains. And it was really kind of revealing. It showed that the isolates from Tree of Heaven um, group separate from all solanaceous crops and hops. So um, if you look at this um, picture in the lower, or this figure in the lower right-hand corner, you can see kind of to the left, you can see a cluster of red and pink and blue. That's where our tree of heaven isolates fall. If you look kind of uh, at six o'clock position, you can see clusters of gray and yellow. Yellow is harder to see, but that's the solanaceous crops and um, as well as the hops. So it's clear that they're separating by protein fingerprint, whole protein uh, fingerprint. Um, and we just need the, the comparative genomics work to see if it kind of supports a similar narrative. Um, so getting on to the, the verticillium nonalfalfa versus verticillium dahlia scenario, um, we conducted a three-year study um, in Virginia and Pennsylvania, um, all the way up almost to the New York border, um, looking at um, how verticillium nonalfalfa and verticillium dahlia interact and whether or not the combination of the two, if both of them were in the tree, would we see less disease severity? Um, and as it turns out, the answer is no, because verticillium non-alfalfi is the more aggressive strain and as such supplants verticillium dahlia. Um, so when you try to isolate dahlia back out of these co-inoculated trees, you seldom get it and you almost always exclusively get verticillium non-alfalfi. Um, and, and of course, compared to the control, inoculate them with water. These were highly effective at, at killing trees. And, um, you know, we're also, this study was set up to try to look across hardiness zones because we know that verticillium dahlia tends to be a more warm climate. Verticillium and verticillium non-alfalfi tends to be a more cool climate. We wondered whether or not we'd see uh, faster disease progression in, in, in hardiness zones, more typical of, of northern Pennsylvania in the northern tier there compared to say the, the Piedmont or, or Southern Southwest Virginia. Um, so, you know, getting back to this develop resistance tolerance question, um, occasionally I would see a tree that looked like this um, in, in the stand and I'd get worried. Um, but as it turns out, we talked about root graft transmission being kind of a fast rapid way. Not all trees in a stand are um, connected through interest specific root grafts some seed origin, um, some new seeds may be blown in uh, and cause secondary invasions. And those seedlings um, may be, because of their, their, their arrangement spatially and temporally, may be separate from the root systems of, of most of the stand. Um, so we went in and inoculated some of these trees and, and certainly they succumbed, they wilted, they died. Um, so it, was, it wasn't a resistant or tolerant tree, we call that an escape. Despite the fact that it was susceptible, it, is, it had escaped infection. Uh, but ultimately, when we inoculated it, um, it, it, it fell. Um, and that's really how you approach kind of looking for disease resistance if you're looking for breeding or something like that. Not, not that we would do this with the lanthus, but you know, when thinking about contemporary diseases that impact native species, if you go in and find trees that appear healthy in an otherwise ravaged landscape, that might be an indication you have some natural genetic resistance. Um, or you could have other conditions like I just described. So this was an interesting story. Our colleague in Ohio was, was inoculating a lanthus um, at a place called the Wilds, which is a safari park and conservation center in Ohio. Um, uh, this was an area that um, was a former mine uh, site uh, and um, now hosts some really rare animals and, and you know, provides recreation and, and a kind of um, wildlife viewing recreation. Um, and what Joanne Rebick, my colleague, went in and she inoculated several stands in 2015. She found that more than 40% of the inoculated lanthus were still alive three years later. Now, this was with the Ohio isolate that we knew we confirmed was, you know, was 
aggressive at killing Atlantis, typically Verticillium wilt will kill Atlantis within a single growing season. Maybe there'll be a little bit of energy left and it'll, it'll kill it out the, early the next season. But that was really interesting. So she re-inoculated them and they didn't die. So this was a real, real interesting story. This is exactly what we were worried about. Oh God, do we have a, a resistant form of Atlantis that it will now not, you know, just basically stick up the middle finger to our biocontrol agent for lack of a better way to kind of frame it. But there's a, there's a backstory here and this is really interesting. Um, this was a reclaimed mine site. Um, and when, if you, if you know anything about reclamation, they tend to put a, a cap over it with like healthy soil, uh, but below is a, 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 you know, highly polluted kind of soil environment. Um, so inoculated trees were super suppressed in the last 10 to 20 years, despite normal growth before that. So that was really interesting. Um, it turned out that we kind of, um, we approached a hypothesis of whether or not metals in the soil could be causing some of what we were seeing. And we used a, basically a fancy instrument called a Bruker Tracer XRF on the tree rings and basically found that there was an exceptional level of iron in the trees. Um, and it turns out that iron hyperaccumulation hyper impacts sporulation and confers tolerance to verticillium. So these trees could tolerate the iron accumulation, but the fungus could not grow in the presence of such high iron. So it wasn't necessarily that the, there was a resistant genotype of Atlantis, but rather a conditionally resistant um, set of trees that in the presence of, of iron, and, and basically they had grown normally for, for a while, and then once they, they hit the cap and penetrated that cap and got into the metal polluted soils, um, they somehow became tolerant to that because they were able to accumulate these metals with little impact on plant growth. And we kind of confirmed this experimentally in the lab by growing seedlings in the presence of, of chelated iron using a sequestering compound and showed that basically um, uh, verticillium wilt disease progression was, was slowed by the presence of increasing iron. So in summary, um, natural infections of verticillium uh, are widespread in the eastern mid-Atlantic. Verticillium is highly effective against Atlantis and fairly host-specific. Transmission is um, a key uh, occurs via functional root grafts, and that's a key player. Um, Co-infections don't decrease the efficacy of verticillium non-FLV. Verticillium from Atlantis appears to be host adapted, and uh, Atlantis may remain an issue on reclaimed mine lands with heavy metal accumulation, where is an issue. So we want to do some more follow-up work on that. We're continuing work on comparative genomics. Commercial production efforts are underway, and. Atlantis remains an important host for spotted lanternfly and brown marmorated stink bug, so its removal across the landscape is important. So with that, I will um, All right. say thank, thank you. you. And